Okay, um, my approach to tuning is my own thing. It's subjective. Everybody's got their way of doing it. And I've worked with a ton of drummers um, that have their own way of doing it. Some guys will sit down and they'll tune the whole kit together. I've seen a guy who uh, would put sustain on a synthesizer and tune each drum, you know, to like quarters or fifths, you know, to the tones. And then I've seen like Chester Thompson take each drum off and away by itself, tune it, put it back on and get through the whole kit, sit down and play. And it's like, oh my God, really? you know, how do you do that? You know, and you're talking about nine toms, you know, or, or eight toms, and it's like, every, so everybody's got their own thing. My approach on a, on a drum, this has got six lugs. So what I'll do, I would start, you know, pick whichever lug I wanted, and I would start there, and then I would move, you know, to every other one. And then I would jump across to the other side and do the same thing. Now, if I'm working on a snare drum or a drum that has more, like eight or ten lugs, I will take, you know, whichever one I'm going to start with, and then I'll move two, and then I'll move two, and I'll move two, and you'll keep going, and you'll go around the drum three times, always moving two, until you get back to where you started. And how I determine where I'm going to start, again, I think of the style of music, what the band's trying to do, what they're trying to play, and what the limitations of the kit is. And I'll keep that in mind, and then I'll start with um, that. And I'll start at the drum. Now this head's already used, and it's already got some dampening on it. So I'm going to just leave it as it is and start with that, because if I came into a job, this is how I would start. If I was your drum tech coming to a show, this was your kit, that's how I would come in and approach it. So, first thing I'm going to do is listen to the drum. Snares are rattling just a little. A little better, and I can hear all the other things resonating and throwing off noise. And then I'll just listen. And you can hear how each one has its own sound. And then I'll lightly put my finger in the middle of the head to kill any harmonics. You hear that one's drier? Mm -hmm. That one sounds pretty good. Same. There's something going on there. This one has got a little piece of napkin tape to it. That one's interesting like that. It's okay. Something's going on. So that, to me, sounds about like the tone. What it's supposed to be. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this off because I don't know that it's working. Now that I've already established that. Go around again. Wow, listen to all that overtone. Now you can hear a lot of overtone. If that works for you and that's what you want, great. There's a lot of producers or engineers that don't want drums to ring. Um, and I'll get into ringing in a second. So I'll listen to the drum. Man, now it's got a lot of tone to me. Now it's got some ring. Some people might like that, they might not. I prefer ring. If you listen to drum samples today, everybody stole 60s and 70s sound. The drums are ringing like crazy. balance out when everything else is playing as well. Yep. So what I'm going to do is just find the one that's in or out. It's just barely out to me. Now I like that, but again, some people might not. Now it's got some ring to it. 
And that's fine by me. The sound man can tweak it a little, but let's say somebody doesn't like it. And there's, you know, you can use everything on a drum to dampen it. Um, I'm going to use black gaff tape. You can probably get this here, and if not, you should order some, hint, hint. Because uh, this is what we use out on the road. This is the professional stuff. It's almost waterproof. Comes in every kind of color, and it's just gaff tape. We stole it from movie sets. Um, and you can do a hundred different things with it, or you can use like this, you know, a napkin. I've seen Band-Aids. I've seen, if I can say it, Kotex. I've seen, you name it, man, anything. Uh, one of the coolest things I saw, and I'm sorry I don't have one here today to demonstrate it, is a cigarette box. And what we did is we took an empty cigarette box and we filled it with BBs. And I've done this with sand. I've done it with little nuts and bolts, gravel that I found out in the parking lot. And you take the cigarette, you put some in there. You don't fill it up. You just put enough in there and you hear it so it rattles. You don't want a whole bunch so it's heavy, but just so it rattles around. So then you, you tape the box shut so it doesn't come out. And you, you find the spot on the head where it's going to be away from the drummer. And you would tape, you know, tape the edge of the box and tape it to the rim. Kind of, I'll use this hand instead so I'm not blocking it. You know, and so every time you would play the drum, it would lift it off and the drum would open up and then it would come back down. So you'd get this, you know, just that kind of like a poor man's noise gate, but you're not, you know, a noise gate's going to cut off the signal electronically. And you can move it around the drum, you can move it closer to the middle, you can move it around, you can find the spot that works. And it doesn't work for everything, but it's one of the coolest studio tricks I've ever found. And it's applicable to just about every drum on the kit if need be. And again, you can try, you know, obviously gravel's going to have a different weight than BBs or sand. And the other thing, that I like to do. Not, it's, not great live though. Yeah, I've done it live as well. You know, again, depending on the situation, uh, we did it with Matt Sorum when I was out with Velvet Revolver for a song or two. We were using two different kits. And for one of the songs, I can't remember what song it was, but, um, you know, we needed that big rock booming open snare drum kind of tuned down low, but it would just go, it would just take off. And the drum kit was set up all the way downstage. So everybody's kind of down front, you got monitors blowing on you, so it, it can get away from you pretty quick if you're not careful. Um, and so the thing about it is Matt could physically play comfortably, he's a pretty heavy player, and the box worked great. It did its thing, it opened up, and as long as you didn't hit it or it didn't fall off, man, it was great, you know. And the, obviously your front of house guy is going to adjust things a little bit with signal processing or whatever, but that's what worked for that. And again, I mean, you can use the blue gel. Uh, Promark makes a sticky gum product. You know, there, there's probably 10 different things out there. What I like to do, and uh, I stole this from Simon Kirk, the name. He calls it the flying bat. And all I'm doing is just taking a piece of gaff tape. And gaff tape's really sticky. And so what I did is I just kind of folded it over into a couple little pieces that creates these little ridges. So it kind of looks like a bat. If you can kind of see that. That's where its name comes from. And you want to try and have fun when you're working. So you come up with cool little names. So it's got some ring, this drum. And again, it's sticky, so be careful. So. I just hunt down the tone. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I've done this thousands of times. It's pretty simple. You just kind of hunt around and find it. So if we were in the studio and we had a lot of studio processing and you had a mic directly on it, you could hear that. And the thing with the flying bat is you can make it any size you want. Now I'm going to put it on here and it's going to be excessive to its, um, to its dampening. 
and I'll press it on there with a stick so it doesn't come off and there's a little bit of ring left the drums really kind of fattened up so you know if you want to play that heavy and you can really lay into it you got not gonna, you know, it, it almost won't take off. If you really, really tried, you could get it to. And if, you know, if you don't want it there, and you want that open tone, you've got it. Or if you want a little bit less, stick some of it on the rim. And again, we're just kind of being creative. Close to that same spot. Now see, there's more of that tone in there. We're kind of in the halfway mark. So if that works for the sound, the sound man's happy, it's a little bit deader. It doesn't feel like you got a big piece of tape on the on the head, you know, that's restricting your, your feel a little bit. So and you get a lot more tone out of that drum. So dampening and muting it again, it just depends on what you're going after. Most of the time there's a ring or a lot of overtone. And you can do the same thing with all the toms. And um, Let's find one that's not really working. I'll do a quick, quick one with that. Both of these. So, what I'll do is I'll take the drum off and I'll just kind of listen to it. I'll just find the two. As you were talking earlier about top and bottom heads. Most of the time you want them even, in theory. But I've done stuff where, you know, one's looser than the other, or one's higher than the other. You can make the drum pitch up, pitch down, depending on the style that you're doing. Or you can tune the drum equally. Some guys, you know, like Stuart Copeland, Neil Peart, real tight, not super tight, but you know, you get a lot of tone. A lot of response up that drum head. There, there's no muting on it, man. It's wide open, so you're getting everything out of that drum when you're playing on it. Really fast, quick response. You can do a lot of finger work, a lot of stick work. Mo most of the time, the heads are tuned pretty even. Um, I can't think of an, of an example off the top of my head, but then you can take, you know, let's say you, you you find the tone that you want, and both heads, you know, are tuned evenly, and you want it to kind of just pitch down a little, you know. <sighs> that, you know, heavier kind of 70s pseudo process rock sound. Then you just take one of the lugs and you just tune it back. You can hear the note about a half to a full note back. Pick one that's away from wherever the mic's going to be. And you just find it and match it and you'll, you know, you'll hit it and it'll, it'll pitch bin down. So let me get to the bottom head. Um, and again, a lot of it's to experimentation, but most of the time when I sit down and tune a kit, I make the top and bottom even. Um, and then take it from there, depending on what the drummer wants. And depending on what the head style is too. This kid has got pinstripes. Um, the head's designed to do a certain thing sonically, and you can't get away from it. It's never going to sound like a black dot. And same thing, a black dot, or, or it's never going to sound like a coded or a power stroke. You know, each one has its own thing. Um, some people love pinstripes. It just depends on what you're going for. The worst mistake I see done with pinstripes is they're undertuned. Drummers play them really slack and really low, and it just sounds like a piece of plastic to me. Because, again, that's what it is. It's a slack piece of plastic, you know. If you're going for that and your sound guy puts a lot of processing on it, then you're going to have a heavily processed drum sound. Again, if you want something industrial or you're going for that... 80s metal tone, or lots of reverb on it, or some heavy gating or something, mm -hmm. trying to get a synthetic tone out of it, that might work, you know. But if you want just a basic good rock tone drum kit, I always say go with a black dot or clear dot. And I use a clear dot because uh, it won't absorb the light. Like if you're playing a gig and there's a bunch of white lights, as soon as, you know, heat gets on that black dot, it will tune down and you'll lose it. So when the red lights, orange, white lights come off, let's say the blue and greens come on, then it'll pitch back up. So you'll wreak havoc or play havoc 
if you're playing with black dots and you know you've got 200 par cans over your head because that dot will absorb a lot of heat and light and it'll you know obviously it's going to expand or contract and the temperature change will be noticed and, and drastic and it's going to change the tone as well uh, guitar players can tell you the same thing when you get your guitar that's why like if you see guitar techs working for the show they're wearing the guitar they're playing the guitar because your body heat and humidity has to transmit into that wood if you just took a guitar off a stand and then threw it on a guitar player within three four minutes the tone and the tuning is going to change because all that wood and metal starting to absorb heat same thing when all those white lights come on you know just another trick I don't know what they put in pinstripes today when I was a kid I was told and in some of the marketing, if I remember correctly, that it did have oil in it. Now, Remo says that it doesn't have oil, it's just the way the light looks between the two pieces of mylar. Uh, the old Evans hydraulics, obviously that, they had oil in them, that's why they were called hydraulics. And the idea of the oil was just there was something in there that kept those two heads from separating and acted as a slight dampener. And that's the same thing, the idea with putting a dot on the head uh, made you, you put something in the center that kind of deadened the head a little bit and they found out at the same time it made the head stronger so it lasted longer. I think you know you've got this this kind of uh, it looks like a gauze material evenly placed all the way around which would be the same as like putting you know a ring on the head you know this is a you know, DW I think maybe these heads are made by Evans it's got a ring on it as well so that's just kind of a natural all-around dampener and I've done lots of stuff, same with the snare. I've taken, say, a dead pinstripe head, and I've you know, taken a razor and cut it all the way around the outside where the rim is, and then cut all the way evenly around this black line, and it sits right in here, so you've got this nice, even dampening all the way around. And you can do a lot of really tight tuning or high-pitched tuning with that, and it won't get away from you because you've got a ring all the way around that's usually pretty even and riding with the head as the head moves. So um, I think you'd have to contact the manufacturer as to what they really put in their heads. I'm not saying that they lie, but I think some of them kind of keep things secret. Uh, you know, again, symbol companies will tell you that their stuff is made out of bronze and what metals are in it, but they're not going to give it away, you know. So, um, and again, you know, depending on if you want to play a coated head or a, a, an ebony style head or a head with a different finish, or one ply, two ply, you know, whatever it's got on it. Evans makes a lot of really interesting stuff with some great characteristics, and their heads are, are just like Remo. I mean, they're pretty weather resistant, pretty pretty strong, and pretty tough. Uh, some situations, I prefer the Evans head more. Again, it's just you know what works for you, and um, and that's it. Finding what's going to work and what's going to sound good for that situation. And as a working drummer, I, I always keep, and in my shop I've got, I even keep used heads. I've always got at least four, six, eight different kinds of heads, styles, makes, because you never know. I can go in and do a session, and there could be pinstripes on the kid, and the guy says, no, no, I want those heads that, you know, are white but smooth. They don't have any coating on them, and, you know, they're one ply, whatever those things are. And, you know, if you've got them, great. You can make a little money on the side or you know, it's a lot quicker. So when I go to a session, I'll bring in lots of different heads, depending, sometimes different symbols, you know, different stuff. Uh, you've got it, I'll bring in different snare drums, you know, because again, drummers are going th and they'll think they've got just God's gift of snare drums, and it might be, or it might not work for that track, you know. And virtually almost every song is going to have a different snare drum, you know, it just depends. These days, you know, I think maybe 30 years ago, drummers went in and played what they played live. You know, and you were asking earlier of an of an example of top heads and bottom heads, and um, the most notorious guy I can think of is Alex Van Halen, because he goes and he he records you know, uh, and plays live with one kit has you know two heads a top and bottom, and when you see the kit live or in the studio you know it doesn't I'm not sure which one is which I haven't worked with Al I've seen a lot of pictures that that you know go both ways live the the kid's got singles and it's got doubles. But that's the best example. And the other thing I like about Alex's drum sound, a lot of drummers really hate it, but that's what a real drum set sounds like. If you set the kid up in your living room, 
I don't think there's a truer sounding rock drum kit out there, like it or not. And it's like if you put a drum kit with just a kick and snare mic and two room mics, that's what they've got. And it's just, to me, a great acoustic sounding kit. But if, if you, as you listen through those early Van Halen albums and as it moves on and he starts using electronics, you can hear the kits that have got, to me anyway, a two-ply or, or two-headed drum versus a single-headed drum. And the few times I've seen him live, the first time I saw him live, he was playing double heads. Two years later, I saw him, he was playing single heads. Big difference. I like the two-head, you know, the double-headed a lot better. Then you've got drummers like um, Carl Palmer off the top of my head who plays concert toms on this side, or used to, you know, and those create a totally different tone. It's a shorter shell, tuned up a little higher, just one head, versus everything over here, which kind of gets into a traditional drum sound where everything's got double heads on it. So he had a lot of great variation of what he could do as well as tone. But it, it fit that style of music. Would it fit today or what's going on with kids? I don't know, you know. So... And Neil Peart as well. He used to play concerts. Now everything's double-headed. What few toms are left, you know. But he still has a pretty high pitch to start with, getting down to a low sound as well as electronic. So he's got a lot of variation. But same thing. I mean, he's, I think he's going for that more traditional sound and approach. So again, it just varies what you really like and, and how you're going to mic the drum too. I think the whole idea, along with the different tone, with a lot of drummers they would pull the bottom heads off because you can stick a mic up in there. Mm. But when you, you know, you have to remember, if you're taking an audio class, you'll learn how a microphone works and how it hears. As the sound travels away from the drum and it creates this wave, it also makes the, the diaphragm and the microphone move that way. However, the, you know, the, the sound wave hits it, it will either push it back and pull it out first or, or vice versa. And depending on how you put that mic or where you put it and where you point it, you know, either at the center or more towards the edge, it will change it. And once you get up inside the drum, then you're talking about something completely different. Because you were asking earlier about how you're going to tell how my drum kit sounds. If you put a mic on the outside, it's hearing it kind of the way you're hearing it. And once you stick it on the inside, you're really abusing that mic, so to speak, with a lot of acoustical punishment. Because there's going to be all that air sound and movement in there. But you might be going for that kind of close-up, tight tone, or to really get a lot out of that shell, more of the shell characteristic and sound versus, you know, the head. It just depends. And again, then you're talking about doing a lot of, you're, you're going to have a close relationship with your sound guy, you know, to trust him and, and get the point across. Because he might not believe in what you're doing, or, or, you know, he might have his own agenda or whatever. So, that, that's a whole other topic and relationship there. So, working with your crew guys. Uh, let me see how this one sounds. It's still got a little bit of a tonal fluctuation. And I think it's just because the top head is a little looser. Let's take it off the snare. sound, let's say, uh, on one uh, lug versus another, uh, does that necessarily mean that that's the one you want to tighten, or is it sometimes, you know, the opposite? It, it would depend, you know, what, what tone I'm going for. Is there one that's higher or lower? You know, what's the, the sound or the tone that I'm going for, and I'm going to match all those to it. I'm trying to tune them all to the same tone within reason. Um, so it's not like a guitar where I'm trying to get four or six or seven or twelve different notes. I'm just trying to get one note and get them all matched as close as possible. And again, you, you know, then you're, you're looking at the bevel of the drum, you know, the characteristics and how well the shell's maintained, if it's got any problems, the plastic, you know, there's a lot into it. Um, so you can only go so far with it. But uh, again, if you've got a, a, a well-made kit, you know, you're miles ahead and you, you're pretty sure that your bevel and your rims and everything are going to be straight, even, and are going to work together.
So you see, as I listen around, this is a little higher than these two on the outside. See, that one's higher. These two are the higher. Those are the lower. So I'm trying to bring it up a little bit. And I'm using a Promark speed key because it fits in my hand versus a regular drum key. So I can feel all the tension in my hand. It's reversible and I can go really, really fast with it if need be if I'm changing heads. We're getting closer. And there you just listen to the harmonic. Just like when you're tuning a guitar. Hmm. You know, you're, you're using one string to tune the next. Right. So that's almost there. And I'm going to hold the drum by the mount, because you're going to mount it that way. It's almost all gone. And whether that's, you know, that's pitched up a little more or tuned up a little more, if that's the, the tuning that you're going for, we've almost lost all that harmonic that was moving in and out. And they're, they're pretty close. See, this one needs to be tuned, because this one's up a little more. Then we'll go listen to it. Yeah, now see the variation that I hear, it's the other drums making the noise. So you have to go through each one and tune it. And again, see this one's pitched higher now. This one's almost lower. So that's what I would do. Um, you know, find, find the one, that's what we started with, I got it even, and it's okay to me, it could be a little lower, depending on what you're going for, some guys like them tuned up, some guys like them tuned down, but that one, say, I would start with. It, is there a certain drum that you start with when you start your tuning process with the toms? I'll usually start with the first tom and then work my way around, but because that one, I, I like this, it had like a, a, a harmonic issue, you know, the heads weren't together. I like the sound and the tuning of the bottom head, so I just brought the top head closer to get them even. I like the sound of the whole drum now, so that's what I would use as my reference. I would get the whole kit tuned to where it was in the steps that I thought was comfortable or wanted. And then, if the drummer came in or, or I wanted the, the pitch to come up, they're all even, so I can just bring them all up evenly or take them down evenly. So you spend a lot less time moving it around. You'll spend your time starting with the first drum and working with all the others, get them all together and close, then again, it's just a matter of if you want it up or down or it's right where it's supposed to be. But that's, to me, where I would start with. I would usually start with the first drum, but since we took that one because it had an issue, that's where I'd start it, where I would start from now, and they'd just go from there. So it just depends. you know. Uh, well, actually, usually I'll start with the kick drum, but... Oh, you do. Normally, the yeah. kick drum's a good place to start. And then you go to the smallest tom from the kick? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I would do and work my way around. Um, some guys will do it one at a time because I want to hear the whole kit. And like we, you know, we just noticed this drum sounds fine now and you hear the resonance of the other drums and what though, you know, that it's not matching in tones or harmonics. So again, the other three now would need to be tuned. But yeah, usually I would start with the kick drum sometimes by itself, especially if you're in the studio, because in the studio they're going to fool with the miking, they're going to fool with the pillows inside, they might build a tunnel, you know, to accentuate the kick sound, they might put another kick drum bigger or smaller in front of it to change the tone or the harmonics, you know, a lot of people cheat to try and get that bottom thing, there's a hundred different tricks to do, but one way to do it right, so 
That's it. Uh, start with the kick and then move on from there. Get all the tones and the sounds the way you want them. And then, you know, if you have to do some dampening or changing, you know, of a few little things, a little bit of tape or, or you know, something here or there, move the mics around or whatever, then you're ready to go and, and your process is almost done from there. So, and then remember, you know, every couple of songs or every take, you're going to have to re, you know, retune and listen to the drums. Live, you don't tune so much between songs. Some guys do, some guys don't, but mainly in the studio, about every take or two, you're going to have to go back through and listen. For me, I try to tune it slightly lower than the E string of the bass guitar because to me it should be the lowest instrument on stage. Um, as far as like how much of a step, I don't really know. I just find a tone that I kind of like depending on what the bass player is playing and I try to bring it down a little bit more. Now the sound man is going to add or take away from that because the kick drum is going to be in the PA, but that's my choice. That's how I would do it. Depending on the drummer and what he's going to do, what the band's going to sound like, or the style of music. You know, obviously, if you listen to like Metallica, the kick drum is nowhere near down there, near where the you know E string on, or D string or, or you know whatever it's tuned to on the bass. It's nowhere near it, and it's got a completely different sound. But you know, just for standard rock drum tuning, that's where I go. Uh, you know, perhaps. Um, adding because if you're exactly the same pitch as a bass, then you might have that problem in the frequency of the PA feeding back in the low end. It could, yeah, it could do that. And then, you know, what if one of you gets out of tune a little bit? You know, if you're both, let's say if you're both E, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, temperature, humidity, your drummer's got a real heavy foot, or your bass player, you know, bangs his headstock against the amp, you know, then you know how it is, man. If, if all three guitar players are, are tuned, you know, to A, and they're all playing an E chord, and one of them slightly out of tune, man, you know, it's like a sore, sore tail cat. So I like, again, just for me, I like the kick drum a little bit lower than the E string. And then the, the kick drum sounds a little different. It's going to stand out a little more. It's the kick drum. That's just how I approach it. Um, and then I would just kind of, you know, take it from there. And as far as like any sort of tones, again, I, I don't listen to a piano or I don't listen to a certain chord or whatever, but I'll find a tone fitting for the session or, or the sound of what we're going for and then work each drum from there in a certain step. And again, depending, the drummer's going to come in and say, these all sound fine or this one needs to come up or this one needs to come down. And I'll also go around and I'll make sure, I mean, drummers can, though very few of them will play chords on the drums because most music doesn't call for it, but I will go through and listen to each of the toms together to make sure, and separate, you know, in that way, so that they're not ringing, you know, that all the harmonics and frequencies are together. So that if you're going around the kit, you know, playing doubles on each tom or in different ways, um, you know, nothing's out of pitch or out of tune. They're all kind of tuned together, and if you wanted to, you could play a chord or a pattern on it tonally, but everything's, you know, tuned and ringing together so that you don't have a frequency that really sticks out, you know. And the, again, your sound man isn't going, dude, what's that, you know, whatever. You know, your, your kick drum is, you know, it's got this really bad, you know, 54 kilohertz or 54 hertz ring in it. You know, what's up with that? Or, you know, whatever. And it, again, especially with like a DW kit who do, you know, tune their shells and they, they make them to a certain tone, you've got to be aware of those, the shell's acoustic characteristics. So like Grateful Dead and two drummers must be nightmarish. Uh, I think the or dead are matter? I think the dead are a little different. Um, and, and they've got so much instrumentation going on stage. But um, I haven't seen The Dead, so I couldn't really tell you. But, I mean, what I've seen them on TV and on DVD, everything's tuned and sounds pretty great. And they've got, you know, not just two drum kits, but a, a ton of percussion up there. But then, you know, say like Phil and Chester with Genesis, you've got two completely different style drummers that are playing and working together. And they both, you know, Chester's playing a two-headed or double-headed kit. Phil's playing a single with, that's all concert toms, and they've got to work together. You know, and they do.
course, a lot of what they were doing was, was sampled after the 80s. So you're hearing the acoustic sound through the PA as well as the sample together. So, so you're talking live, they would play along to samples, MIDI's or whatever? Yeah, at, at the same, like uh, that started becoming popular in the late 80s. Um, you know, like when, especially when D drum started coming out and becoming popular. You had, you know, the D drum trigger sound and you had an acoustic sound as well. And people were combining them and mixing them. Or some songs, you know, you could go around and, you know, whatever you're programming through. And it's the same thing with any of the modules out there. You know, you can get, say, one song, you simply just want the acoustic kit. And the next song, you want some sort of heavy industrial process drum sound. Well, then, you know, your tech or your sound guy or your drummer is going to pull, you know, push that the sample uh, and pull the acoustic kit, kit back and then there are a lot of drummers out there those two guys for example at sometimes who would use a combination of all of it you know to get you a, a big fat or different or you know you've got you don't hear them all separately but you've got this what seems to be an individual drum tone that's different and striking and works mm -hmm. or in Phil's case you know a heavily processed drum tone with a lot of uh, compression so that's really popular now in, in metal to have uh, triggered snares, triggered mm -hmm. you know drums, especially because they got the double kick yeah. um, without having actual you know two two uh, bass drums. Right, so and, they, and have to, they have to do it, and it's fast, and they they want it to sound a little bit more crisper instead of so it's almost like this electronic you know yeah, it's yeah. Alex yeah it's a lot more process because again you know once you get to a certain speed. And, and you're using, you know, all acoustics, uh, they're sympathetic to a lot of things. And um, to get, for me anyway, to get some of those sounds, you're looking at doing a lot of dampening or a lot of changing the drums characteristics to where it's going to affect the way it feels when you play. So yeah, that's where, you know, triggers and, and electronic sounds would come in because the kit could feel the same to the drummer, but what you're going to hear is completely different. For example, uh, when I was working with ZZ Top, um, you know, Frank plays through D drum modules. And, you know, most of the kits that you see, they're, they're designed to look a certain way. John Douglas is the drum tech and designer, and he does great work. You know, and the, the drums, like I, on the tour I did, the Whack Attack tour, uh, there were spinners in the kicks with rims. You know, they, they've got all this stuff that should never be on a drum kit, but is up there, and it looks great, and it sounds great. And you're hearing, it, it's almost all with the exception of the snare and, and the kicks and for the most part that's all synthetic what you're hearing but at the same time it, it's not really comfortable to play so when I came in and started working with Frank and playing the kit I asked him you know can I tune the kit and he was like yeah you know sure whatever you want to do and I tuned it up like if you were really gonna go play it and he immediately noticed a huge difference because again it all felt right you know, it's like I'm sure you've seen a Simmons drum, you know, uh, uh, the old Simmons octagon shaped pads, you know, yeah, it's yeah. got this like polycarbonate hard surface right, that's right, like right. playing on a countertop, you know, mm -hmm. and it just, it just feels wrong. It sounds great, but you know, it's, it's completely different and, and kind of, you know, gives your hand little shocks. And it's the same thing, you know, if you're drumming, like I play with a constant rim shot and not all drummers do but you know if you do every now and then you really feel it and if you're gonna do a four hour gig you're really gonna feel it the next day so like you're talking about you'll have synthetics and stuff mixed in depending on speed or whatever for some of those drummers and in Frank's case we because the heads would just be slack you know the triggers doing all the work the mics that were up there are simply just picking up the cymbals we don't care about or people didn't care about the way the tom sounded but once I kind of tuned them and you didn't really hear them uh, they felt completely different so Frank's playing became completely different and he you know played better a little more animated because suddenly to him it didn't just sound like a real drum kit but it felt like it too right. like that kit out there in the picture no matter what it looks like it felt like wow you know a real drum kit mm -hmm. even though you're playing a a tom that's you know three inches deep or three feet long you know so different you know different things work in different ways so but yeah like you were saying especially with a lot of speed metal or, or where you've got to have a lot of speed and consistency and excuse me and again you're talking about a guitar that's got an even more expanded frequency range because you know it, it whether it's a six or a seven string guitar you know you're talking about a ton of 
low end, you know, for some of that music, which is unnatural. You know, that's just not what a guitar sounds like. And then you've got to get all that, you know, crunchy ear candy high end as well. Mm. So now your guitar went from, you know, this much on the bandwidth to a third more or twice as much. Well, then you've got to try and fit all these other frequencies in there. Because, again, you've only got so much in the bandwidth. There's only so much room in there to, to you know, mark your spot, you know. And so you've got to find somewhere else in there to put the kick drum where... It still kind of sounds like a kick and works, but isn't interfering. And then you've got to find where to put the cymbals, you know, on the higher end, and get the toms kind of in the middle, you know, and get the snare sticking out somewhere in there between, you know, 1K or 3K or whatever to have its, you know, bark, its crisp. So, um, so I think in some ways the drummers get cheated, you know, because there's not a lot of bands out there. I mean, Sabbath was great, and, and though they weren't playing a lot of fast stuff, everything was really heavy. And I think because it wasn't so fast, and there wasn't so much processing, the drums really came through. And it's an old, fat Ludwig kit, basic Ludwig sound. And all the kids grew up and became influenced by that, and then faster, lower, heavier, deeper, you know. And again, your ears only hear so much, and there's only... So only so much room on that canvas to put stuff, and you've got to find a place to put it. You know. Um, a question about like mixing drums in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, one way I learned, you know, mixing drums that you kind of want to arrange when you're panning, um, kind of relative to where the parts of the drum kit actually are. Are there? Do you think like sonic advantages to doing that? And and how deep do you want to actually pan left and right when you're when you're mixing? Is there you know, certain things that are going to sound more pleasing if you're putting your cymbals way right or way left or, you know, kind of keeping it all in a certain range um, to get the most realistic sounding kit? Uh, it's going to depend on the producer, I think, and, and you know, what the band's going for. I, I'm sure you've heard, you know, CDs or records where, you know, the rack one, let's say the first rack toms over there, and, you know, the second one might be here, and then the first floor tom's there, and the last one's over here. Or you've heard records where, you know, as the drummer moves around the kit, the kit moves, you know, from side to side. Sure. So it's just going to, again, I think depend on the, the producer and the style and personal choice. But there are some drummers and stuff out there where, like, you know, yeah, the, the vocals, if it's not the wall, classic wall of sound, you know, the vocals are right up front and right there, almost over the top too much, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, rather than have any drums kind of in the middle, you've got, you know, the bass and the guitars right in there and the drums are just to the off outside, so that when you're hearing two kick drums, man, you really hear that separation in the kick drums. The band's just kind of coming at you, so it just, it just depends, you know, and then where they're going to put the toms and mm -hmm. stuff as well. It's just kind of personal taste. To me, I always liked... I usually played a bigger kit, so I always liked everything to kind of move from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. With respect to if you were listening to it in mono or just one side, you know, you still wanted to hear enough of each drum if you went around to where, you know, by the time, let's say you just had the left speaker, by the time you got over here, you know, it wouldn't be where this drum was. Right. You know, you still have to have some balance, but. It just depends, you know, where they're going to put it. Yeah. And there's some music today that I hear where the vocals aren't necessarily buried, but they're certainly not out front anymore. Yeah. You know, there's other things going on that that almost cover them up, you know. And, and if that's what you're going for, cool. But and I guess like a, I guess to kind of delve even a little deeper into like mic placement and stuff like that. Like, is it gonna you think create? Is it gonna be good or bad for the tone if um, you know? Because each when you're in the studio, everything's going to be mic'd up on its own, tom-wise at least. Mm -hmm. um, most, you know, most of the time. And if, if you're panning in different places, is it going to be nice to each um, you know, thing that you're mixing as it's hearing the other instruments from that mic? Because you know, it's going to pick up a little bit of each instrument in each mic. Like, are they going to fight frequencies at all um, if, you're, if you're panning them not like that? Or? Panning is usually going to come down when you're mixing. When you're recording, you're trying to get, you know, the, the main essence, you know, the, the best sound you can get. You'll probably do a little bit of panning while you're recording, but probably not too drastic or too much. Right. In, you know, production, post-production, that's when you'll get into some of that, so to speak. As far as, like, when you're miking the drums and talking about them, you know, you said, like, kind of fighting 
for space or fighting with each other. The drum kit's really difficult because, you know, the drum kit has to be set up for the drummer to be physically comfortable with. And again, like I would mentioned before, I mean, I've seen some or done some sessions where, like, we have just recorded the kick track by itself. Then we recorded the snare track. Then we recorded the hi-hat track. So you've got ultimate isolation, you know. Um, because, again, you know, there's some guys, you know, that, you know, the hi-hat's going to be, you know, man, you know, right here, you know, or it could be, you know, out here. And this is going to be probably the worst, you know, bleed on the kit because you're going to have a snare drum mic usually right in this area, mm -hmm. you know. So depending on its pattern, it's not going to pick up much of the hi-hat, but then, you know, even though this is two, three feet away, you're still going to pick up all this stuff. And like I demonstrated earlier, if you hit the snare real hard or you hit the the kick drum real hard, it's going to send vibration through the air and it'll make other things make noise. So that's where noise gating comes in, miking technique and stuff. But again, it's subjective to how the drummer sets up the kit. And, you know, if he's got everything tight and close and that's how he's got to play it, you're not going to get away from that. So you've got to use some studio gadgetry and, you know, do the best that you can. Um, you know, getting each drum tuned properly so it's not interfering with the other, like I was talking about earlier, so that each one will ring on its own and it's they won't cause, you know, any sort of cross harmonic or anything. And then, you know, just capture the best sounds that you can and then when it comes into mixing. Because, you know, when you're mixing, I mean, you've got to get it right on tape or, or, or you know, today digitally to begin with. Now, certainly with Pro Tools, I mean, you can do anything now. You know, when Mark and I were kids and trying to do it, man, you had to really be on it. And no offense to today's musicians, but, you know, in the 70s, the greats and, or the golden age of rock is what it is because those guys could really, really play. Where today, we've all been to shows and, you know, Straight to vinyl, you the, know. The, the show's on computer. I won't, I won't name any tours, but I've done plenty of tours where I didn't use one of these because it didn't matter. I set up the kit and maintained it, and the show was on disc, you know, and the bands there going through it. So. so opposed to live playing, recording, Tommy Lee has the huge bass, you know, the marching band thing, or the long tube, right. but is that for looks? Sometimes, you record with those, yeah. sometimes it, I don't know, I've never done a Motley Crue session, so I don't know if he's recording with them, but, you know, Alex Van Halen, again, that guy had some of the most amazing looking drum kits that there ever were alive, and yeah, I mean, they were all mic'd up, and they were all kind of connected, or, you know, until he started getting into triggering, uh, you know, they were all used together and, and had to work together. If I remember correctly, on the last tour, he was just using like a blonde maple Ludwig kit. You just, I think it was two or three up, two down, and two kicks. Might have been a third kick, I don't know. But yeah, some of that's for looks, some of it's for sound. Years ago, and I still have the drum kit, I had a drum kit built that had uh, 24 by 28 kicks. And they looked great, but I knew from my experience recording and stuff, when a lot of people make records, they're going to build a kick tunnel anyway. Whether they use blankets or a second empty drum shell or put a second kick drum in front of it or whatever, or they get a you know, four foot piece of foam and, and roll it up or whatever. So I just had it done that way and it, you know, it just creates this monstrous kick sound. At the same time, though, I played heavy enough that I could play that kick drum because it takes a lot of oomph to move that air. Where there's some drummers who they just they just don't play that way. They don't put that kind of power in it or whatever. So you know, again, if this is a deeper than average kick drum, I would say this is probably an 18, maybe a, or even a 20 inch deep kick drum. Where most of them are say 14 to 16 inches. For some guys, that wouldn't work because it's deeper. You're going to have to really work that kick drum to move the air inside of it. You know, not everybody, I mean, I have a lead foot, and I've worked really hard to get it, so it would be okay for me, but some guys don't, and they're never gonna. It's just how it is. And as many times as it's worked for me, I've had, audi sorry, I've had auditions or playing situations where the way that I played, which was really loud, did not work whatsoever. Perfect example, I auditioned for the cult. I was too loud. <laughs> Imagine that. So... Okay, let's go on to the kick drum and do the tuning of the kick drum. Okay. Um, actually, kind of on that subject, just be really quick. 
Um, so it, it's actually possible to record uh, like the snare isolated and then actually use that as a trigger or, or uh, as a triggered. Yeah, snare. yeah. Well, you could, you know, you'd record it on a track and and, and you could either use that sound and mix it in some way sonically or you just especially now with Pro Tools you've got a signal there on a track right. you know and you can use that sig what we used to do years ago uh, use this as, as an example is use like a keypex or a noise gate and a signal would hit that whatever sound it was and you could use it to use it to trigger a mic in the room an ambient mic or whatever and you can do that today with a signal on the tape or the disc to, to trigger something to open or to trigger a different sound yeah. that doesn't have to be there in the room. It could be out of a module. So that, yeah, every time you're hitting that snare off in the control room or somewhere, it's, it's triggering something else. And, you know, you've got to, every time you hit the snare, there's a car horn or a dog barking or breaking glass, you know, whatever sound you're going for. Or, you know, another snare drum sound. You're getting two, you know, two right. snare drum sounds together. If I was working and I came in, I'd find a snare drum that's got a lug rod missing. So priority one would be to rummage through my box and put a lug rod in there and fix it. Now as you look around the drum, there's a couple lug locks. So there's still some companies that make these. And you just kind of put them on, you tune the drum the way you want, and then you know either finger tighten them or take a pair of pliers or something and just give them a little tweak. There's the nylon lug locks. Those are just like aftermarket type of things? Mm -hmm. like yeah, them? well some manufacturers still make them. Ludwig used to make them and they were standard on their drums like in the late 70s. Yeah. I don't know who makes these. I've got some at home that are a little different. Here's another lug rod that's missing. And you can see kind of around here and there, there's a few of them that got them. And then there's people that make lug rods that have plastic or silicone or things on them so they won't detune. I used to put silicone on mine so it would keep them from detuning. Then once lug locks came out and, and people made those, I started buying those and using them. There's a lot of different things on the market now to keep the drum from detuning. Because again, like me, I play with a heavy stick and I mean, I just beat the hell out of everything. Yeah. I break everything. I broke an earth ride, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I destroy everything. And if you came over and you saw my hardware, I've still got a bunch of old hardware like I used to play with Mark. Half of it's welded together so it wouldn't break. And it doesn't collapse, but it was like it's either that or I buy a new cymbal stand every year or six months. Yeah. So, um, depending on how you play and what you play, there's a bunch of stuff out there, and there's different things you can order. Again, kind of try and narrow down what the problem is and take it from that point. Because um, I think DW and there's a couple companies that make lugs that have some sort of synthetic. Uh, material on them that will keep them from detuning and you can tune around them you know and they just won't back off. Is there even like a like solutions you know? There's you can use um, and I did this yeah, as well stick. you can go to an engine shop or, or an auto supply shop and get Loctite uh, that works pretty good right. and again I used to just go you go to like Home Depot and get a clear tube of silicone and you just cut the tip off to where you can get the lug rod in there and you know I would squeeze it up and stick the entire lug rod in there, get it coated in silicone, like, and then like caulking or not caulk. You want to make sure it's just pure silicone, right. like clear. Yeah. I mean, if you want to use a color, have at it. Because it doesn't doesn't dry up. It's not gonna. Like it's gonna dry up, and you know, eventually, because you're gonna tune, you know, it, you're gonna have to redo it again. But it would last for a couple gigs, and you know, they'd still detune in some. Obviously, this one is gonna detune. You know, yeah. there's just so I'd put a, a you know like one of these a lock on it and keep it from doing it. Um, and sometimes like I used to be notorious on the floor tom, you know, from riding it. So that one would get it as well. But yeah, all the lugs or all the lug rods, I would stick them in silicone and, and you know stick it on there uh, on each of the drums, and then there you go. That would help somewhat, you know, for yeah. the most part. But if you've got a problem or you've got one that keeps doing it, then I would take a look at the lug as well. I would pull it off and look at you know the packing and see maybe there's something going on inside. Maybe it's got an issue. Maybe yeah. it, maybe it needs to be replaced, or the you know the lug rod base itself is cracked, or there's something going on with it. Um, what's the downside if there is any to brand new heads? Drum? The first downside is quality control because there's so much demand. Um, when I do a tour and we pre-order, we'll order like a gross or more of drum heads. Mm -hmm. So that way you've got 
a hundred snare heads, which you could go through in twenty shows, yeah. or a hundred shows, or you know, four hundred shows. It just depends. Again, uh, there's so much of a demand, quality control at some point is going to slip. So you're going to find one, like we were talking about the sticks. You know, you're going to find some that just don't work right. So, you know, we send those back or whatever. The second thing I would say is, and, and quality control involves craftsmanship. There could be epoxy that, you know, got all over the head or it's not seated evenly or the two plies might have a ripple. You know, there, there's a bunch of things. Or around the edges, it could have just crinkled, so you've got this little kind of line in there, all these things that will affect it. Or it might have too little or too much coating. Um, the second thing I would say would be um, stretching the heads. Some guys like them stretched, some guys don't. That's a personal thing. Um, and getting heads that are going to match close enough. They might all be pinstripes, so they might all be black dots or, or you know coated ambassadors but there could be one that's not going to match and when I was a young drummer what used to bug the hell out of me I'd go buy a set of heads and you'd get them home and yeah you know one of them didn't match or it buzzed or it mm -hmm. you know it just it had something going on with it and at that point you can't take it back you know I mean I'm not making a record with it but still you know I gotta live with that head for two months or three months or a week whatever so um, again, with the stretching thing, don't beat up the shell. There, there's all kinds of tricks to stretching out the head. I would usually just put it on the drum, give it a basic tuning, and just you know put some hand weight on it. Don't stand on the shell. Don't do anything that's going to damage the head or a shell. You can sometimes just hold it here and just you know work the palm of your hand around it. Just give it a couple punches, and you know just make sure it tunes up even all the way kind around. Kind of like the strings, strings on a guitar. Same like thing. You got to play it for a while. Yeah. And retune it. Yeah, again, same, same thing, yeah. same thing. So, and again, like I said, the most notorious thing, because you're a drummer, you're in the back of the club, you know, and the par cans are this close to you. And depending on how much power they've got, I mean, they're going to throw a lot of heat onto the kit or onto the shells. And if you've got a white kit, it's not going to get as hot. If you've got a navy blue kit or a black kit, you know, or a dark green kit, it's going to absorb a lot more heat, mm -hmm. you know. So that'll change things as well. Um, and if you're using strobes or, you know, any kind of pyro on stage, that's a drastic change. Um, used to do tours in the 90s where people would play a lot of sheds or amphitheaters. And a lot of them in the south have air conditioning. And it's pretty hard to play at night when it's, you know, 100 degrees with 100% humidity. So you got to have the air conditioning on, but then you're battling, you know, because that air conditioning will cycle. And, you know... You'll go from it's 100 degrees on stage to three minutes later it's 75 degrees on stage blowing frosty air, man. And all the pitches go up, all the guitars go out of tune, and it's just like ah, but, you know, that's just how it is. You know, it's not going to be perfect. And as I spoke earlier, a lot of it's just about keeping your head and just just letting all that stuff go away. Because you'll see a lot of musicians, man, they'll be pissed off and attituded after the show or whatever, and. Um, if you want to let it get to you, you can. And if you want to let it ruin your performance, you can. My best advice is that is that um, if um, if nobody knows you're doing anything wrong on stage, they might not ever know. But if you tell them, they're going to know. Unless your band completely train wrecks. And uh, as we were speaking earlier, I mean, Cheap Trick and Deep Purple are two of the best at that. They'll make a joke about it and start the song over. You know, usually better than they were ever playing it. Or, or we're playing it before. So, you know, like David Lee Roth said, if you're up there smiling and you look like you're having the best time in the world, everyone's going to believe it. But if you're on stage and you're playing and somebody does something wrong and then everybody in the band looks over, that just told everyone out there what happened. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. The best thing you can do, uh, like the Ramones used to do, they practice in front of mirrors. You look forward, you look at the audience. You don't look at each other, you don't turn around, you focus on the audience. They paid to see you. So show them what they want to see. And if something, something's going to go wrong. So when it goes wrong, just let it go. Make a note, deal with it later. You know? And as long as you don't show the audience what happened, they might not ever know. If you're up there smiling and just looking like you're having the time of your life, because it's showbiz, it's smoke and mirrors. A lot of times you're up there pretending. You could have a, you know, a cast on or 103 temperature or you know, whatever's going on or your girlfriend left you or whatever. 
Man, as long as you convey that you're having the time of your life, everyone's going to believe it. And they bought a ticket. They want to see the best show they can see. They don't. They didn't buy a ticket to come in and hear you whine or complain or bitch or whatever. You know, they came in because you are projecting their fantasy off the stage. That's showbiz. That's what it's all about. You know. Uh, another thing, click track. If you're going to be a drummer, you have to know how to play your click track, whether you uh, use it live or in the studio. Today, almost every band out there uses some form of metronome, whether it's um, a metronome or some sort of click track, or you're using like a digital performer or Pro Tools rig, um, or there's some shows out there where everything is syncopated to uh, a pattern generated on a computer. You know, the lights, the backing tracks, everything runs together off this. The technicians are basically just keeping an eye on things and keeping it moving. So my best advice, if you want to learn how to play to a click track, is go out and get you a metronome and learn how to play to it. Playing to records is one thing. Uh, some of them, you know, are synced up with a click track, some are not. But the best practice for a drummer is to just learn how to practice with one. You can get a metronome that you can listen to at a reasonable volume for about, you know, between 20 and 100 bucks, 120 bucks. And you can use it at gigs. And, you know, you can get you an ear rig for fairly cheap these days. Or you can get a metronome that's got a blinking light on it and just watch the blinking light. And I've created rigs before where we used a 9-volt battery to just... I put an LED on a cable somewhere where only the drummer could see it, say, behind, like, you know, in front of the kick drum here or behind one of the toms where the audience wouldn't see it. But the drummer could see the light blinking. He would adjust the tempo. And while the band, the singer's talking or whatever's going on, the drummer's already sitting here tapping his foot. He's got the tempo of the song. He's ready to go, and he just has to watch that light, or you can hear it. And again, this day, this day and age, it's a reality in the studio um, with Pro Tools, and it's for most bands, because so much now in the rock show or any modern music shows is on computer. A drummer has got to be able to play with it. And it's just practice and becoming comfortable with it. So whether you're practicing your rudiments or you're practicing your drum kit all together or uh, you know just freestyling or whatever, learn to play to a metronome, move the meter around, up and down, incorporate it into your band's practice. Um, because whatever you're going to practice and however you practice is going to be how you play. If you practice sloppy, you're going to play sloppy live. If you practice lazy or you're thinking about other things, that's going to transpire into your performance. Or if you don't practice enough, you'll get out there and you'll you'll play too fast or you know you'll you'll overshow or whatever something else will take away from the performance rather than you showing up being comfortable and uh, confident and ready to play unless that's how you don't want your band to be if you as a produce as a producer would you suggest they play to click track if they're not practiced to it yes even if they haven't tried it yes. when you bring them into the studio you would you would want them to try yeah if you're going for any kind of music that in hopes will be played on the radio because let's face it, most people listen to the radio with their foot. They don't necessarily listen to it with their ear. They might sing along, but everybody is tapping their foot to that song. And if you want it to have any commercial potential whatsoever, in other words, if you want it to make money, then you've got to have you know a steady beat, whatever that me or tempo is going to be. Um, and almost every producer and almost every record I've done, there's been a metronome. And if there wasn't, we went back later in Pro Tools and we made it so. And I won't name any names, but I can't tell you how many drummers out there that are world-class, world-named drummers that don't have that good a meter. And thank God for Pro Tools. Or, as I've said before, there are a number of records on, you won't find my name on them, but I'm the drummer on them. You know, some serious bands with some serious names and serious sales out there, we would track all day with the drummer. He'd go home or go to dinner, and, you know, till midnight, we'd be in there and I'd redo the drum tracks. Uh, and I've seen this with guitar players. I mean, same thing. There's tons of records still to this day that, you know, the band's picture's on the cover, but the musicians on the cover did not play on the record. Someone else did, because it's a different world, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice and a lot of understanding to become comfortable with it. Um, it's not like playing live. So, but, you know, that's just one of the realities of, uh, of the biz. And a lot of that was because the drummer wasn't playing to a click track. You know, or was playing to a click track and, you know, things were moving a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a great example, I worked with ZZ Top and 
we would play the songs to a click track. I just had in my station, I just had a drum machine and all the tempos were already programmed programmed in for whatever the songs were and they ran in the working order of the show. You know, whatever the show started with, that was the first song and all you did was you just either, you know, scrolled through or just tapped once and it went to the next song, you know, and off you went. Well, the thing with Frank is, you know, he comes from a different time and a different age and he can play to a click, but it's a live show. So if it pushes and pulls, I had to stop it, which, you know, that's taboo. That's not the whole point of a click track. Not to say, you know, this, I don't think this really had anything to do with Frank's ego or whatever. It was just kind of comfortable and the way the show moved. And so you had to pay attention to that, or it was my job to pay attention to it. So if Frank started to get off, you had to kill it right then and there. And then you'd have to sit there and listen to the tempo and bring it back in where he was comfortable. And there were times where if it got too far out, that was just it. That was the end of the click track for that song, you know. But he was, <clears throat> he's the only individual I worked with like that, where you made the click play to Frank. Now we didn't move the meter. If it was 130 beats or 100, and, you know, 110 beats per minute, that's where it stayed. We just had to, you know, you just had to make it ears. comfortable for him because he's listening to it in his ears. And you know, once he would start to get off, it's only going to screw him up. So you know, the band's got to move, and it's the blues, so it's got to breathe and it's got to have a certain feel. But there are other drummers and stuff like I said. I mean, man, it's regimented. It's just locked in there, no matter what the style of music. And again, a lot of the artists I've worked for, if not the whole show, half the show's on the computer. And that's what you're going to get, you know. If, even if the audience doesn't hear it, people are hearing it on stage and that's what they're playing to. In theory, and most, most drummers do, you know, when you're playing whatever you're playing, you've always got the left foot going. And you can hear, there's a lot of guys that, you know, will play whatever. And you can always hear the hi-hat going, you know. Especially where it's like demanded. Yeah. Um, and then there's some drummers that are, you know, that are not necessarily like ghosting with it or whatever, but I mean, you know, they're, they're working both feet through the pattern, and, and that's just their style and they're comfortable with it and how their rhythm moves. Um, and then there's other drummers that, you know, they, the left foot just doesn't move. And the way I was taught with the kit, you know, you've always got, even if you're not here in the hat, you've always got it in there. And years ago, I had a habit that I'd picked up because I was playing double bass, and I'd put my left foot, you know, over on the hi-hat, so, you know, the one and and, or the one and two was always that way. And if, if it got to where it was on the eighth note, then that would really screw the guys in the band up, because you'd come to a stop, and the beat, you know, this is... And there's the beat, but they're, they're hearing that, so they're half a beat or a quarter of a beat off. And, you know, it was unconscious to me because I just got, you know, right foot gas, left foot brake, so to speak. So that was just my comfortable way of playing. But the guitar player, we'd stop and, you know, oh, you know, he's 20 feet away. He hears the hi-hat. He's thinking, that's the beat. You know, okay, maybe Rod got off. And it took me a while to correct that because, again, it was my personal bad habit. And, you know, I still do it every now and then, but I try not to. So... <laughs> You know, but yeah, the, your drum teacher, because that's the whole thing. Even if you're not going to play polyrhythmically, you should to learn four limb independence, because that's what it's going to all be about. If you're going to play the drum kit, everything should be able to. Even if you're just doing quarter note patterns, should be able to work separately. You know, so okay. let's go ahead and give an outro now. Go ahead and you say, hey, thank you for coming or whatever. Unless there's other items that do we need to do. Else? We're going to do the kick a little bit, but. Yeah, we got tuning down. Yeah, yeah. You know, the kick is just subjective to the sound that you're going for, and you know, if you want to put a blanket in there, or you know, what the kind of tuning or whatever. And if you're in the studio, there's a lot more stuff to it. Um, and the only thing I really had to say about it was about the bottom thing. There's a lot of drummers that are way into the bottom thing, but what they don't understand, um, and you can use this too if, if people ever say it or you want to know. The bottom tuning, first off, is that's just how John played, and most drummers can't emulate that because that was just John, and he had a great, fast, feisty foot. And the other thing that the mistake drummers do is it's not just that the drum had two heads. The drum was tuned like an old marching bass drum, and if you've ever been around a concert bass drum or a marching bass drum, it doesn't sound anything like a rock band kick drum. And John got away with it because Jimmy was a great producer, and they mic'd it and made it sound a certain way. 
because if you took that kick drum or if you took a marching kick drum and you tried to play it with a rock band, it's just booming and it, it just destroys everything. But John had great dynamics and finesse with it and could really work with it in the way the band played and pushed things. And it worked in Led Zeppelin and it worked for John because that's how he played. Most other drummers it won't work for because it's just too much or they can't drive the drum a certain way, you know. Anyway, that's all I was going to say about that. Um, it was just tuned that way and that's how he played. So it's not just a combination because a lot of drummers think it's two heads and it's a closed kick drum. It's a lot more than that. So that's it. Um, as far as an outro, uh, practice and wear hearing protection. That's the most important thing so that when you're my age you'll still be able to hear. Uh, thanks and continue your musical education. Take it as far as you can and, and uh, keep going. Learn uh, a lot of basic skills as well as music besides uh, things like uh, basic law, basic business, and basic accounting practices as well because that will be most important to you once you get over the age of 20 and you become a working musician. And if you don't understand the basics of those fundamentals, some basic psychology and how to read your way through a contract, you'll find yourself in serious trouble. So, Because most musicians don't make a lot of money and most musicians that play on records don't make any money. It's the writers and producers that make money. So again, understand all those basics. That's it. Play. Have fun.